Alright then, hopefully you'll remember that we've been discussing miracles and have defined a miracle as a specific event that would not have happened if only the natural order had been operating, where the natural order is understood to involve physical entities, their interactions, and the actions and interactions of animals, humans, and things with those powers, following Tim and Lydia McGrew's definition. In addition, my thesis statement was that miracles as defined are possible events which are identifiable and distinguishable from naturalistic events whose validity can be investigated by historical inquiry and reason or logic. Having completed the preliminary steps in discussing the possibility of miracles and their identification in part two, I'd like now to move on to the objections against the possibility of miracle claims by their very nature. Perhaps the two largest arguments that have been raised and carry parallel to miracle claims are the objections by David Hume and Benedict Spinoza. And these arguments are still carried in philosophy textbooks to date. Given the prominence and the detail of these arguments, no treatment of miracles, I have argued, would benefit by leaving them out. In general, Spinoza objected to the possibility of the occurrence of miracles, whereas Hume objected more towards the identification of miracles. I've already discussed Spinoza in the video before this, and so what's before us now is to discuss Hume's objection to miracles. Hume's extremely popular essay of miracles lays out a two-pronged assault on miracle identification. The initial objection raised by Hume argues that it is impossible in principle to prove that a miracle occurred. Hume reasons that even if the evidence for a particular miracle claim is strong, it is still impossible to identify an event as a miracle. This is because standing opposed to the strong evidence of a miracle claim is the equal contrary argument from the uniform experience of an overwhelming majority of people who have never witnessed a miracle. According to Hume, he writes, quote, No testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that his falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact, which it endeavors to establish. And even in that case, there is a mutual destruction of arguments, and the superior only gives us an assurance suitable to the degree of force which remains after deducing the inferior, end quote. In other words, Hume asks us, what is more miraculous, that a miracle occurred or that the eyewitness testimony are deceived or trying to deceive? Hume concludes that since there is nothing inclining us in either direction, that the wise man cannot hold that a miracle occurred. Miracles are improbable and therefore no evidence can ever serve as a means to overcome miracles' intrinsic improbability. The second argument Hume raises is what is sometimes called his in-fact arguments, wherein he argues that miracles cannot serve as full proof because the evidence for miracles are poor in general. He evidences this by four major complaints, the first one being no miracle claim is attested by a sufficient number of witnesses. The second, people crave the miraculous and are ready to believe. Third, miracles occur only amongst the barbarous, which I mean, I take him to mean uneducated. And finally, or miracles occur in all religions and therefore cancel each other out since they support contradictory doctrines. What can be said in regard to Hume's twofold objections? Well, I'll begin by addressing Hume's in principle argument first and then move to his full, fourfold in fact argument. As a way of introduction, Hume's in principle argument appears to have some merit behind it. The caution that Hume brings to the table here in regards to miracle claims is not in of itself bad, nor is it irrational. Rather, a healthy dose of caution is quite respectable and, moreover, helpful. However, given this boon, there are serious and fatal problems with the in-principle argument. Let's delineate four that debilitize his objections. Perhaps the most debilitating problem with Hume's in-principle argument is that it was formulated on faulty probabilistic equations. You'll recall that Hume argued specifically two claims. One, miracles are by their nature utterly improbable, and two, no evidence for a purported miracle can serve to overcome its improbability. Taking the second claim first, it was soon realized by philosophers in Hume's day, such as John Stuart Mill, that, quote, if one simply weighted the probability of the event against the reliability of the witness to the event, then we should be led into denying the occurrence of events which, though highly improbable, we reasonably know to have happened." End quote. Take two examples, one from Bill Craig and the other from Thomas Sherlock. Suppose, first of all, that the news reports that a winning lottery number is 7492871 and that someone claims to have won. Based on Hubes' reasoning, we cannot believe the citizen claiming to have won. Or consider another example following Thomas Sherlock. 
If we only admit testimony when it accords with our common perceptions, then a man living in a hot climate, for example, would never believe the testimony of others that water could exist in a solid state, state as ice in a cold climate. What is lacking in Hume's probability equation, so to speak, is the probability that if the event in question did not happen, that the witness testimony would be just as it is. As Craig explains, quote, to return to our example, the probability that the morning news would announce that a pick as 7492871, if some other number had been chosen, is incredibly small, given that the newscaster had no preference for the announced number. On the other hand, the announcement is much more probable if 7492871 were the actual number chosen. This comparative likelihood easily counterbalances the high prior improbability of the event reported. We're asking here, which is more probable, M or not M, relative to our background knowledge alone, abstracting from the specific evidence for M, end quote. The notion is captured well in Bayes' theorem. How does this apply to miracle claims? Well, again, Hume claims that miracle claims are so intrinsically probable that no evidence can overcome it. However, with the probability calculus fully in place and with all variables accounted for, even if miracles were intrinsically improbable, this improbability can be offset if the explanatory power of the miracle is sufficiently powerful. Craig notes, quote, unfortunately, Hume never discusses the second ratio representing the explanatory power of the miracles occurring or not occurring. He focuses almost exclusively on the probability of the event given the background information, or the intrinsic probability of a miracle, claiming that it is so inevitably low that no amount of evidence can establish it as a miracle. But this is just plain wrong, since no matter what non-zero value we place for the first ratio, the miracle may be very probable on the total evidence if the second ratio is sufficiently large." End quote. In other words, as long as miracle claims are possible, no amount of intrinsic improbability can deter a miracle claim that has sufficient explanatory scope. It is simply false that no amount of evidence can overcome the supposed improbability of miracles. Second, the in-principle argument seems to be false in its claims as to the amount of evidence required for a credible miracle claim. It is suggested that there must be a considerable amount of evidence in order to allow a miracle claim to be heard. The skeptic here seems to be arguing that in order to believe a miracle occurred, you must have an enormous amount of evidence. But why think this is the case? Because a miracle is so improbable, the skeptic may say. The Bayes' theorem shows that, that rationally believing in highly improbable events doesn't require an enormous amount of evidence. Craig notes, quote, in order to establish the occurrence of a highly improbable event, one need not have lots of evidence. The only plausible sense in which the slogan is true is that in order to establish the occurrence of an event which has a very low intrinsic probability, then the ev evidence would also have to have a very low intrinsic probability. So to return to our example of the pick in last night's lottery, it is highly improbable, given our background knowledge of the world, that the morning news would announce just that specific number out of the numbers that could have been announced. In that Pickwinian sense, the evidence for the winning pick is indeed extraordinary." End quote. Yet would we claim that there must be extraordinary evidence? I think not. If the skeptic continues to press that there must be, then I think the only response to him is that it is plainly clear that he is ignoring the probability calculus here. For these two reasons, then, I think the claim that no evidence can counter a miracle's intrinsic improbability is false. But what of the first claim inherent in Hume's in principle argument, namely that miracles are, in fact, improbable? Hume claims that the uniform experience of mankind supports that miracles are improbable. Is this true? I really hope you see the problem here. Such an assertion by Hume is obviously question-begging, and I think C.S. Lewis says it's best when he says, quote, Now, of course, we must agree with Hume that if there is absolutely uniform experience against miracles, if, in other words, they have never happened, why then they never have? Unfortunately, we know the experience against them to be uniform only if we know that all the reports of them are false. And we can know all the reports of them to be false only if we know already that miracles have never occurred. In fact, we are arguing in a circle." End quote. In other words, to say that humankind's uniform experience is against miracles is to assume that all miracle claims are false. Second, C.S. Lewis argues that there's a second major problem with Hume's idea of the uniform of experience of mankind against miracle claims. Lewis notes that we cannot state that mankind's experience is uniform based exclusi exclusively off our observations because this again is question-begging according to Lewis. He writes, quote, 
We observe many regularities in nature, but of course all the observations that men have made or will make while the race lasts cover only a minute fraction of the events that actually go on. Our observations would therefore be of no use unless we felt sure that nature, when we are not watching her, behaves in the same way as when we are. In other words, unless we believe in the uniformity of nature. Experience, therefore, cannot prove uniformity, because uniformity has to be assumed before experience proves anything." End quote. Lewis states that the greater question is about the frame of nature itself, for according to Lewis, no study of probability is possible or impossible if nature is not uniform. Such an observation takes us back to our discussion of Spinoza. Concisely, the indeterministic elements within quantum mechanics should cause Hume's supporters caution before appealing to uniform experience. Thus, for these four reasons, Hume's in principle argument does not work for the following reasons, as a recap. One, Hume's use of relative values of probabilities are being applied incorrectly. Two, excessive demands of evidence are not necessary given the probability calculus. Three, claims of uniform experience are question begging. And four, experience cannot support the uniformity of said experience, for this is also question begging according to Lewis. Having briefly discussed Hume's in principle argument, we can now turn our gaze onto Hume's fourfold in fact argument. You recall that Hume argued that miracles cannot serve as full proofs because the evidence for miracles are poor. He evidenced this by four major complaints. One, no miracle claim is attested by a sufficient number of uh, witnesses. Two, people crave the miraculous and are ready to believe. Three, miracles occur only amongst the barbarous or uneducated. Unedu and finally, four, miracles occur in all religions and therefore cancel each other out since they support contradictory doctrines. Before we look at each of these points in turn, a general consideration is in order. While each of Hume's points have various degrees of weight, they seem to miss the point. Craig notes, quote, all of Hume's points have force, but the fact remains that these general considerations cannot be used to decide the historicity of any particular miracle. They serve to make us cautious in the investigation of any miracle, but the only way the question of historicity can be solved is through such investigations, end quote. In other words, if Hume's in principle argument fails and miracles are possible events, and what's more probable in certain capacities, then it is up to historical investigation to determine the plausibility of miracle claims. With that consideration out of the way, Hume begins his in fact argument by suggesting that evidence for miracles are poor because no miracle claim is attested by sufficient number of witnesses. Hume argues that natural explanations are always preferable to testimony of miracles because the eyewitnesses don't meet certain criteria. What are these criteria? Well, Hume lists several. To be a good eyewitness, once one must have the following, according to Hume. One, undoubted integrity to place him beyond all suspicion. Two, the eyewitness must be educated. Three, the eyewitness must be of unquestionable good sense. Four, the eyewitness must be highly esteemed, having nothing to lose by lying. And five, the event in question must be public in a major part of the world. Now, in review of these criteria, I hope it's plain to see that these are obviously too stringent. If we were to apply Hume's criteria for eyewitnesses outside of miracle claims, for example, then we would most likely have to dismiss the majority of what we presently know about the past. Not all eyewitnesses have the luxury of education, for example, a high standing in public opinion, or a flawless character, and yet the failings of eyewitnesses in these respects, and still a witness to murders, news stories, and car crashes, does not negate their testimony. If we hold the Hume's criteria, then I would hate to serve on a jury let alone be a defendant in a court system with only an eyewitness alibi. Lacona notes, quote, While data meeting Hume's criteria are certainly desirable, historians do not hesitate to make historical judgments when they are unmet, since they have a number of tools with which they can work, namely criteria for authenticity and arguments to the best possible explanation, end quote. Second, the assumption Hume makes in regards to eyewitnesses can readily be challenged. While it is true that those individuals who are less intelligent do not have all the resources to resist gullibility, and while it also may be true that there are deceitful individuals around and that numerous miracle claims abound, Lacona notes, quote, the converse is also true. Miracles are both claimed and believable by highly educated persons in modern society, and truthful witnesses abound. Certainly caution is in order. We must consider miracle claims on a case-by-case -case basis. If the evidence for a miracle is credible and no plausible natural explanations exist, to reject it on the basis that other miracle claims abound among the ignorant and uneducated is to be guilty of arguing an ad hominem." End quote. Thus it is up to the historical investigation to determine the quality of the eyewitness testimony, assuming testimony to be valid only if the above criteria are met is not how history works, and for good reason. 
Next, Hume argues that the evidence for miracles are poor because people crave their miraculous and are ready to believe. Having reflected on this point for a time, I've had difficulty with this argument because it seems like an overgeneralization. I have no problem admitting that there are people who navigate by the sale of wish fulfillment. But this fact does not mean that there are others, and it does not negate the fact that others set sail by other proper epistemic means. The one does not rule out the other. It is clear, at least to me, that amongst the set of individuals who believe in miracles, there are those who operate under various methods. Thus, Hume's charge rings hollow to me in this sense. The McGrews note in their quotation of John Pulfer a similar thought when they write, quote, the love of wonder may cause people to listen eagerly to all the wild tales of travelers, but as John Gorfum Palfer notes in his Lowell Lectures, there's a limit to what may be explained by this principle. Everyone knows for himself that it would not be sufficient to make himself accept such a story as the resurrection without inquiry and full proof, when the consequence would be, as unquestionably it was with the early Christians, that he must devote himself to a new course of life, relinquish old friendships and associations, undertake unaccustomed labors, and face a host of appalling dangers." End quote. The third point follows on the heels of the second when Hume argues that evidence for miracles are poor because miracles occur amongst the barbarous. If these events were to happen among the educated, Hume reasons, then we would have better reason to accept the miraculous. But again, this argument rings hollow to me. It would suffice for me, I think, to point simply to the earlier response regarding, response regarding eyewitnesses. While there are those who do not have the luxury of education, this does not nullify their sense, nor does it debilitate them from being able to report what they sense or see. Take, for example, the paradigm case Hume uses in his essay of miracles, that being the resurrection. The McGrews note, quote, to call first century Judaism ignorant and barbarous would be itself historically ignorant. And to suggest that this absolves us from taking the testimony of, of the eyewitnesses seriously is a classic example of trying to dismiss evidence without doing any actual argumentative work. Nor was first century Judea, which had been a Greek possession for three centuries before Rome took charge of it, such a backwater as Hume would have his readers suppose." End quote. Succinctly, while Hume is right in being cautious, this broad generalization just doesn't work as an argument. The fourth and final point Hume makes in his in fact argument is that evidence for miracles are poor because miracles occur in all other religions and therefore they cancel each other out because of contradictory doctrine. Hume seems to reason on this point that there is a sort of all or nothing proposition here at work. Either we accept all miracle claims to be valid or we accept none of them to be valid. If we do the former, then contradiction results. If we do the latter, then there is no such thing as a miracle. Hume finishes his thought by discussing several miracle claims that he finds dubious, for example, the cures of Vespasian. It is clear that in pressing this line of argument that Hume does not even consider the important factor that evidence plays in miracle claims. For example, Hume selects some rather obscure miracle claim while ignoring more attested claims of miracles, example, the resurrection of Jesus. Peter Bain notes the evasive tendencies of this tactic. Bain begins by quoting Hume's essay of miracles where Hume asks which would be the greater miracle, that the miracle in question occurred or that the testimony was incorrect or purposefully misleading. Bain writes, quote, Let us proceed then to the comparison. What was the next step to be taken in Hume's argument? What did his own statement require him to do? Clearly to take up the miracles which Christians allege to be true, to set their evidence fully and distinctively forth, and to point out that however plausible that evidence might be, its fallaciousness would be no miracle compared with the miracle affirmed. But every reader of Hume's essay knows that he has done nothing of the sort. Hume does not ask what proof is offered that the Christian miracle took place. He calls to the bar certain miracles which, with which Christianity has nothing to do, enters upon their evidence, condemns them as falsities, and then calmly informs the court that the Christian miracles are disproven." End quote. In doing this, Hume has ignored the weightier historical evidence of one claim at the expense of suggesting that all miracle claims cancel each other out. But again, one of the most important points behind miracle claim investigation is the evidence for the claim. And by ignoring the stronger claim, Hume does a disservice to the honest inquiry into the facts of the matter. The McGrews conclude, quote, to substitute an examination of reports of other miracles and to insinuate without argument that these others are as well attested as the central miracle of Christianity is mere clever misdirection. To misrepresent the facts in the attempt to improve the parallel is irresponsible or worse. Such substitutes for argument do not constitute a serious challenge to the credibility either of the resurrection or of Christianity itself." End quote. 
Second, if Hume is correct in noting that most miracle claims are poorly attested, that these events appear centuries after the purported event and are not well evidenced, then the existence of counterfeit currency does not negate, negate the existence of the genuine. In the same manner, poorly attested miracle claims are scarcely able to rule out well evidenced ones. Just because there are some miracle claims that are indeed fake or contrived does not mean that genuine miracle claims do not exist. Again, miracle claims need to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Thus, it would seem to me that Hume's two objections are unconvincing and at times fallacious. Given the developed probability calculus formulated after Hume, and given the rather obscure and at times fallacious reasoning in Hume's in fact arguments, I conclude that we hold Hume's concern for caution with miracle claims as valid, but nothing more. Hume has failed to show that miracles are intrinsically improbable, and what's more, his four reasons for deducing miracles as poorly attested are inconclusive.